All right, so in all of this, of course, what we're doing is we're, we talked a little bit about, oh, there's products in these nuclear reactions, but we haven't really talked about how do we predict what products are gonna come out, right? So far, I've just kind of told you, like, oh, this produces a positron, or this reaction produces a bunch of neutrons, right? And it's not entirely clear how I'm coming up with that, and the answer is, of course, I looked it up in a book, and I'm just telling you. But we can, to a certain extent, we can predict what types of products are gonna come out of nuclear reactions if we know something about what makes a nucleus stable. Right, so this video is going to be all about how do we determine uh, if a nucleus is stable or what does a nucleus need to do in order to become more stable. All right. So the main thing that we look at with uh, nucleus stability is we look at the ratio of neutrons to protons. Stability of nucleus. The neutron to proton ratio. All right, so, and the annoying part about the neutron to proton ratio is it's not one rule that we can just kind of follow and always know what it is. The rule changes depending on how many protons you have. Right? So if we look at, if our element has less than 20 protons, right, so this is basically, um, hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, neon, right? Those kinds of things, um, the, the, the lighter elements in the periodic table. The stable nuclei, a stable nucleus has a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons, right? So these are things like carbon-12 helium four. Oops, helium is not three. Now, there are always going to be exceptions. The stable isotope of lithium is lithium seven, right? So that, right, obviously, in this case, we don't have a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons. In this case, lithium has four neutrons to three protons because, right, we have a charge of three, so that's three protons. We have an overall mass of seven. So the difference between seven and three means we have four neutrons there. But it's close. It's close to one to one, right? So this is the other thing, and this is one of the things that students always kind of get frustrated with is it's a rule of thumb. It's not something that we're going to follow exactly to the letter all the time. So there is room for interpretation here. You're not always going to get a one to one ratio every time. So sorry. All right. If an element has less than 20 protons, a stable nucleus has a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons. When you get above 20, as the number of protons increases, um, the ratio I should, this is the neutron to proton ratio of neutrons to protons um, increases for stable isotopes. Okay, so for example, the most stable isotope of iron, iron is atomic number 26, so it's got 26 protons. The most stable isotope of iron is iron 56, right? This is a neutron to, pro yeah, neutron to proton ratio of 30 to 26, or about 1.15 to one, right? Um, as you increase, let's look at iodine, right? Iodine has a neutron, the most stable isotope of iodine is iodine 127. Iodine has atomic number 53, and so in this case, our ratio is 74 to 53, and we have about a 1.4 to one ratio uh, for iodine. So notice what's happening, right? The stable isotopes of carbon is one to one, right? That's at atomic number six. At atomic number 26, that ratio is starting to diverge from one to one. We're starting to get more 
neutrons for every proton. So in iron and things around iron, the stable ratio is going to be around 1.1 or 1.2 to 1. Right? We get to iodine, the stable ratio is around 1.4 to 1 at 53. And we can keep going, right? If we get all the way up to gold, gold is a much heavier element than iodine or iron. Gold is 79, and the most stable isotope is 179. So this is a ratio of 100 to 79, and this is a ratio of 1.49 to 1. Right? So this is the annoying thing, is that the most stable ratio, the preferred ratio, is not constant. The preferred ratio changes as the number of protons changes. But there is a trend. The more protons we have, the higher the ratio of neutrons to protons has to be in order to find a stable isotope. Now, we refer to this as the belt of stability. Right? And so this general rule here right, leads to the belt of stability. Right? These are where most of the stable isotopes of elements exist. All right, so the belt of stability, if we want to represent it graphically, we're gonna graph, well, kind of, here's our number of protons, and then over here is going to be our number of neutrons. And what we're gonna find is if we go from like zero to 20, we're gonna, 20, we're going to have, if we just graph the stable isotopes, we're going to have a pretty straight line of around one to one, right? So kind of a, a straight line that's, at this point, we have about 20 neutrons and 20 protons. So each dot equals a stable isotope on this graph. Once we get to 20, it starts to deviate a little bit from the uh, from the one to one line. We start to get a little bit higher. And then as we go, it keeps getting higher and higher. Right. So once we get out to uh, what did we do? Iodine at 53. So let's say this is iodine at 53. Right. So here's our iodine. At that point, right, we've gone a little bit farther on the neutron. Uh, axis than we have on the proton axis. So the neutron axis at this point, we're going to have about 76. Um, and this is iodine, what was it, 127? Oops, not 76, but 74. My math is bad, sorry guys. Yeah, 74. So this is iodine 127. Iodine, of course, has an atomic mass of 53. Right. And then it just kind of keeps diverging until we get out to things like um, gold, which is gonna be way out here at 79. Let's see, we've gone 23 and 26, so this is 79. Gold is gonna be way up here, where we have 79 and 179. This is where we're gonna to get to about 100. So 100 neutrons, eh, more or less. Pretend that my graph makes, makes sense on scale, right? Okay, so all of this is fine. And, and notice the important point here in my crudely drawn draft, graph that's pretty questionable is that if we draw a straight line, can I draw a straight line on this thing is the question. We're gonna call that a straight line, right? This is our, this line represents a one-to-one -one ratio of neutrons to protons, right? If I draw that straight line there, notice that as we get higher and higher in our number of protons, we get further and further away from this line, right? These are the dots are the stable isotopes. This is where our compounds want to be in order to be stable. One to one is not going to make them stable unless we're way down here below 20 protons, right? Otherwise it has to get bigger and bigger as we go. So the question is, what if we have an isotope that's above this line? So
so isotopes above the belt of stability. All right, so the belt of stability, I guess I didn't write this out, but the belt of stability is kind of this thing here, right? If we kind of bracket all these stable isotopes as we go, right, that's our belt of stability there. So if we're above that, so if we have an isotope here, for example, right, what does that mean for our, uh, for the stability of that isotope? It means that we have too many neutrons for the number of protons. So we have too many neutrons in the nucleus, right? Too much mass in the nucleus. There's not, it's going to be hard for that thing to, uh, to stick together. And so if we have too many um, neutrons, what we're going to do is we're going to lose electrons from the nucleus to create more protons. Okay, so if we have a neutron and that neutron creates an electron, let's balance this equation. What do we have left? We have mass and we have charge. Right? So in order to balance this equation, we have to have a charge that equals zero. We have to have mass that equals one. And so this is a proton. Right? So if we have a neutron that emits an electron and gets rid of an electron, that creates a proton. And so we're going to change out a neutron for a proton. That's going to move this isotope kind of down and to the right. One more proton, one less neutron. We're going to move toward the belt of stability. Right, and so isotopes above the belt of stability are going to lose electrons, right? We call this beta minus decay. Equals losing electrons. Right? And electrons we call beta particles. So we have a beta minus decay because we're losing negative charge. A beta minus decay is losing electrons. Isotopes above the belt of stability have too many neutrons and they undergo beta minus decay. They lose electrons. What about the other side, right? So if we have an element that doesn't have enough neutrons compared to protons, so isotopes below the belt of stability the opposite is true. Too many protons. Right? And so we need to get rid of protons in order to, and convert them to neutrons, right? So we want to convert protons to neutrons. So let's take a one, one with a proton here, and that's, and we want to make it into a neutron. What do we need to do? We need to get rid of a positron, right? So this is, a positron is a beta plus particle, right? It's the opposite of an electron. So this is called beta plus decay. Lose positrons. And so what we can do is we look at these compounds. And so we make these isotopes that are below the belt of stability, or we make these isotopes that are above the belt of stability, put them in a detector and see what types of particles are created. And what we find is that if we put isotopes that are above the belt of stability into this detector, they emit electrons. And if we put them below the belt of stability, we put them in the detector, they emit positrons. And so this belt of stability, the idea of the neutron to proton ratio really helps us figure out what uh, what type of radioactive decay we're going to undergo because we're always going to try and move back toward the belt of stability, right? So if we lose a positron, that means that we lose a proton and gain a neutron. And so that's going to move our, on that graph that we had, it's going to move that isotope up and to the left, closer and closer to the belt of stability because it was below it before.